Welcome to the Jada Edwards podcast. It's season two, and I'm still sharing with you what God is sharing with me. So here we are, the first episode of season two, and I had all these things I wanted to talk about. And recently, I've had a lot of conversations with people just about anxiety and worry and life just feeling like a lot. And so today, I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about what we do when life is a lot. Um, I think that we think about worry and anxiety, all kind of mental health challenges that we're having. I mean, it's almost overused now. We classify everything as worry, anxiety, narcissistic personality. Just, I'm like, we got Google and we know all the names. And so we love all the labels and the language. But what do we really do about it? Well, you know, it's human nature. And so you may say, well, it's not really my personality. I'm chill. Nothing really worries me. But human nature says that we are prone to be anxious and worry about things. Otherwise, it wouldn't be addressed in Scripture. Scripture always addresses what needs to be addressed in us where there's deficiency. So Jesus says in the Gospels, don't be anxious, don't be anxious about your life or what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body, right? Because God takes care of us. He takes care of the sparrow in the field. He's going to take care of you. Paul addresses it again, Philippians 4, a scripture that many people quote often, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, you know, make your requests known to God. And so when I think about that, I love the Bible. I really believe the Bible has an answer for everything. But I was trying to think, like, what does that really mean? Because when I'm feeling anxious, generally, and you may, it may be different for you. But for me, when I just declare out loud, be anxious for nothing, that does not always tend to resolve my anxiety. And so sometimes I think, um, especially as believers, we're like, if I just know this scripture and say this scripture and keep keep repeating it, it's going to work. And there is power in scripture. Don't get me wrong now. There is power in that. But there also has to be a practice behind that. What does that mean? The, the command to not be anxious or to, to not worry doesn't really tell us how to not be anxious. It just says you are not called to live a life of anxiety because God is in control. And so depending on your life, your personality, how you're wired, what's going on with you, I think there's things we have to be practical. Like how do we think through what that really means um, to be anxious for nothing? Well, one of the things that I think that's really plaguing us is that this generation, and by generation, I don't mean one particular one, but everybody probably from late millennials on, I think um, worry and anxiety is kind of at some unprecedented levels. Um, And you see it across all cultures. Um, So many studies are showing that people are worried about really two things, the state of the world and the state of their lives. And I think some of that comes from just access to information. But The idea that uh, we are carrying this weight, we're worried about what might happen, what could happen. Um, We're worried about so many scenarios that might not ever be a reality for us. And so I'm like, how do I deal with this guy? Because listen, if somebody texts me and they were like, I'm anxious, I'm having a hard day. They do not want me to text them back. Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing. They want to talk about it or, you know, at the minimum say, I'm going to pray for you. But What's going to be helpful is for us to have some practical things. So the culprits, when I think about what creates worry and anxiety, which, by the way, you got to be honest with yourself to know what you're worried about, and what you're anxious for, because sometimes you're trying to be a G, you're trying to be hard, you're like nothing bothers me or, you know, I have the love of the Lord. I have the power of Jesus. Oh, that's great. But you probably still have some things that are stressing you out. And for me, um, I tend to be a pretty independent, autonomous person. And so even admitting anxiety is like vulnerability for me to even say I'm worried about something because you have to admit that you're not in control and that you're you're not trusting God the way you want to trust God. So it's a whole bunch of vulnerability even admitting that you're worried about something, um, let alone that that anxiety is kind of taking over your life in that season. So when I think about that, like what are some of the culprits? So two things come to mind for me, especially based on a lot of study, observation, research. There's so much good information out there. But it's probably true if you think about your own personal life and your personal friends. These two culprits tend to be the source of a lot of anxiety. And that is, number one, the absence of connection. And the second one is the abundance of information. 
So I think the absence of connection for various um, reasons, we, I mean, even before COVID, the, the rise of online activity, digital activity really gave us tons of connection points. So our connection points increased, but our community decreased. And so community was no longer just having lunch with your friends or meeting up, doing something. It was a Facebook group or it was some kind of social media chat. It was some kind of chat room. It was like... We kind of redefined it. So instead of it um, being something that augments or makes better the way we already do community, it really began to replace it, especially uh, obviously when COVID hit. But, you know, Facebook groups, online groups, they they have great things. I mean, I don't care. Even in gaming, you've got so many things we do. And it's always like, do you want to play this online? Do you want to play dominoes online? Do you want to play solitaire online? You can meet somebody from, you know, uh, Ghana. Y'all can play solitaire together. And so... I think when those things were new, it felt like, oh, my gosh, I'm connected with this person on the other side of the world. But, I mean, we were connecting over dominoes or we were connected over some group we're part of where we like to buy the same things and we like to eat the same food. And so the community wasn't really there because community can't happen in those kind of spurts. Community doesn't happen from just intentional meetings. Community happens from living with people, like doing life together. And so... I say the absence of connection is a huge deal because um, we've had a lot of touch points that have increased, but not a lot of community. And so, you know, what happens is we're just surrounded by a lot of people and still lonely. We're, we're involved in a lot of things. We're a part of a lot of organizations or even movements, but no one really knows us. So you probably can think of several groups you're in or uh, things you're a part of or, or people in your life who are part of things and ask them, but who knows your birthday? Like who's coming if your sister gets sick? Who's coming to your mom's funeral? Who's going to check on you when life gets hard? Those groups tend to form connections that are shallow and they're only based on some kind of shared experience or shared affinity. It's not like I'm choosing to do life with you. And so, you know, I remember as a kid, because I'm Gen Z, so I'm just going to put that out there. You know, me and my friends, it was like, we wrote a note in school. Can you spend the night? Go ask your mom, can you spend the night? Spending the night was like the thing, you know? It wasn't play dates where we just get together for an hour in some, you know, trampoline park or whatever. It was spend the night. Uh, you know what happens when you spend the night with somebody? You get to know them. You create extended family. You know what other people eat. You know what time they go to bed. You just learn all of these things because that's what you do together. Um, and when you don't have a lot of conveniences or affluence affluence is another culprit I think of anxiety because the more you have the more you got to deal with what you have when you don't have a lot of affluence and everybody don't have their own room and their own line and their own car and there's a lot of sharing going on you also form community so I think just the evolution you know of our culture coupled with the affluence of, of certain societies can lead to this real absence of connection now the second thing is the abundance of information. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you've ever had that moment where you're reading something, even though it's good, but maybe you're like three pages into some article or you're on your seventh link about that topic and you're like, this is too much. I just don't need to know this much information. Sometimes I'm on Twitter in particular, and because it's all of these snapshots of people's words, uh, for me, because I like to process things, um, I like to read words and, and know what people are saying and thinking, it can be overwhelming. There's times where I'm like, even things that I agree on, I'm like, it's too much. I don't want to know that much. And, you know, if you think about how societies were built, right, like how long it took to travel somewhere, how you had to prepare to go and be with someone, you had to receive someone in your home. You know, I've got family coming in town soon. And so I'm thinking, I need to clean the guest bedroom, see what they want. What's their schedule like when they get here? You have to do more to accommodate people. And and when they're here, I'm not going to have time for social media and 52 text groups because I'm with people. Um, the best moments are when you look up and the day has passed or a holiday has passed and you're like, I didn't take any pictures. Like that's a moment um, right now at this time we live in. And so the abundance of information can be like a two-edged sword. It's great. You know, we can diagnose ourselves. You're like me. I go to the doctor. I'm like, let me tell you, it's diabetes. <laughs> and I have this, this, and this. You know, my doctor's like, and take a seat because I actually went to school. I know you have Google, but I know what I'm talking about. So information can be good, but it can also be overwhelming because I don't think that 
humans were created to take in as much information as we're taking in. If you think about a book and how many books can you have open at one time, right? Maybe you have one that you're halfway reading. If you're like me, I'm reading two or three books at a time. But even if I want to read two or three books at a time, I'm limited or I once was limited to how many books could lay on my desk and be face down and pages more. Now I have my laptop and Kindle or whatever I'm reading online and have 72 tabs open. And that's how my laptop looks. I'm like, what is that? Oh, that's this. Oh, that's this. There's so much that we can just kind of have open and hanging in the balance that uh, the information can just be overwhelming, even information that's good. And so I I think those things can create anxiety because (laughs) this is let me tell on myself for a minute. I'm trying to find some storage bins for my son's room, storage bins. That's it. Now, once upon a time, you'd have to go in the store. Maybe you went to two or three stores and you had to figure out which one you wanted out of those two or three options. But now guess what? I'm on 12 websites. <laughs> like, do I want black or espresso? Three cubes high, four cubes high. Uh, do I want it double wide or just single? Well, do I want beans or do I want, oh my gosh. Now, it's great to have options, but also then it takes you a week and a half to figure out storage bins for somebody's room as opposed to all you used to have was Kmart. <laughs> you went down there and dealt with what they had. If you didn't like it, then you went to the art store and bought your spray paint and made it look different. But it's like, I'm all for advancement, but I think as a culture advances or what they call advancement, we as humans, we as believers have to figure out, is that advancement good for me? Is that healthy for me? So I think the abundance of information, like I said, not even bad information, sometimes is just too many options of what's for dinner. It's just too much. You're just like, I don't, I have 17 Pinterest boards over eat for easy dinners. Which one do I pick? You're like, Oh, my Lord, just the, the one easy dinner. So all that stuff, I think, can really build up and create a lot of um, anxiety for us um, that just makes life not easy. And by easy, I don't mean problem free. But Jesus said in Matthew 11, if you come to me, my yoke is easy. My burden is light, meaning like you come to me. I take your burden. And even though life will bring things at you, we can do this together. Easy because you're not in control. Easy, Jada, because you don't have to make the final decision. Easy because you're not relying solely on yourself, right? So it's just that life has a simplicity to it when when we yoke up with Jesus like we should. But when we don't and we have this absence of connection and this abundance of information and then those side things of affluence and all these other things, you're going to find yourself just overwhelmed with information, insecurity, doubt, all the things. And so I was reading something and um, this particular article was saying Gen Zers and young millennials are more concerned about um, their finances and debt and career and when they're going to have a family or if they have a family, what that means and where they're going to be in five years and 10 years. Are they, are they, are they on the right track? Those kinds of things um, more than ever before. And so, again, I think it comes because there's options. Everybody has more things they can do now. I don't have to go to college or I don't have to go this route. So it's great, but also the abundance can just be more than what we're created to handle. So anyway, when I think about all that, all the things that are the culprits, you know, for our anxiety, then I'm like, okay, how do I approach this in a healthy way? And by the way, I had to try this on myself before I come like, here is the word from on high. This is just my trial and error season of trying to figure out how to really be healthy without being disconnected. Okay, so I can't just be like, I'm not thinking about it. I'm going to shut it down. That is not dealing with anxiety. That is disassociation. <laughs> like to be in it, know it's real, know it's present, and still be like, but I'm going I'm to think about it this way or feel about it this way. So I think if if the culprits are the absence of connection and the abundance of information, then the solution would be the opposite of those. And so for me, instead of the absence of connection, my solution is I have to turn up connection. Turning up connection, I am an I, I'm an extrovert, I'm an ENTJ on the Myers-Briggs, I'm an ICD on the disc, whatever you into, I'm an Enneagram 3. That just means I love people, I love being out and about, I love being busy. So connection for me is not always a one-on-one coffee. Like, 
unpack your story. I can do that sometimes. That's not what fills me. What fills me is getting with me and three or four of my friends laughing and being crazy and having fun, music, concerts, whatever. So that's connecting for me because between those little down moments, we're going to say something. These are my safe people. Um, and then I mix that with, you know, longer conversations or whatever it really means to connect. And so that is not just multiple points of, of, of touch points, but like deeper experiences that somebody knows me. Cause when I'm with my, my friends, they look at me and when we say, Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? They know if I'm really good, they pause because we've spent enough time together where they're like, mm, now what's really going on. And so you can't skate by it. So when I am feeling overwhelmed, turning up connection, like finding my people that I can really relate to, it really helps because number one, I feel safe. And, and sometimes anxiety comes because we don't feel safe. We don't feel like somebody's got our back, you know, feeling like you have to figure out everything on your own or you're going to fail is going to make you feel anxious. My friends make me feel like, girl, you safe. I remember when we were in Girl Scouts and, you know, we were swinging on the playground or whatever that history is. Or I remember this thing we went through together. And so they're not measuring your life the way you're measuring your life. That's why community can really help turning up those connection and community points. So they help me have a different perspective because my friends or people that God brings in my life, sometimes it's new friends. That's a whole nother a whole nother conversation. New friends that can feel like old friends, but people will bring different perspective because people always see your life differently than how you see it. And so when you're like, ah, fire, they're like, it's fine. It's fine. You know, they either going to tell you about somebody whose life is really crazy or they're going to encourage you. They can just get you off the ledge. So community helps. But I think community also helps because it gets you out of yourself. Um, I've had more times than I can tell you that I met up with a friend out of selfish reasons. I was like, ooh, let me tell her about my life. And then she started talking about her life. I'm like, you know what? My life is, we going to wait because we need to talk about her life. Um, that gives you perspective. And all of a sudden, you're like, it feels good to be her safe person. It feels good to think about something that's not my stuff. And then you walk away after dealing with your friend or praying with them or being with them. You're like, God, you know what? We're going to figure it out. And it's not that it goes away, but perspective, because that's what creates the anxiety. So, you know, turning up connection is huge. Figuring out what that means for you. Um, and I'll say like one other thing about connection. It, it's only valuable if it's intentional. I mean, if it's just, it, everything can't be random, especially in, in the society we live in. Sometimes you got to schedule it, make it work, make it happen, inconvenience yourself. Um, sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, if you don't have close people or a real community, ask the Lord for that. He wants us to be in community. So I'm like, okay, God, I talk to people all the time who are like, I don't have a close friend. That breaks my heart, you know? And so sometimes uh, we got to find that. We got to create that or be the friend, you know, ask God. And sometimes you put your feelings out. You may get your feelings hurt, but you got to put it out there and be like, can I go deal with this person? Okay, no, never mind. We'll just talk about shoes. All right, it's okay. Go on to the next person. And so if you want that, you know, we have to try to be intentional about those relationships and be introspective because if I want deep connection with people, I have to be comfortable with the depths of who I am. And so I can't expect a person to come and connect with me deeply and I'm not offering up deep things about myself. That requires that I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm thinking about my junk all the time, blah, blah, blah. So um, you have to be intentional about it and you need to have a level of introspection because your own self-awareness is going to contribute to, to those connection points. Uh, so turn up connection for me. And then the second one is turn down information. Now, everybody's like, oh, I'm on a digital fast. I'm taking a break from social media, which I think is funny that people have to announce on social media that they're taking a break from social media. I'm like, just take the break. See who misses you. It's fine. But but anyway, that's neither here nor there. But turning down information is not just social media. It's wherever you get information from. You know, sometimes it's people who are gossipy and messy and the things they say don't contribute anything positive to who you are. You're like, I need to take a break on you. Sometimes it's books. Sometimes it's music. Sometimes whatever, whatever it is, like turning that down a little bit and saying, I think I'm good right now. I know what I need to know about that. Uh, I'm an information junkie, junkie. And so even when it comes to Bible study, sometimes I'm so tempted to be like, I'm going to read all six chapters. I'm going to write a whole curriculum, all the things. And God be like, stay in this one verse because you ain't got that yet. And that is challenging for me to minimize my information 
like the information that I take in, those sources of input. But I have found that when I decide to manage myself and kind of cap that, keep it in moderation, it's helpful for me because then I don't have the 17 tabs open with 17 different ways to have cubes in my son's room. Just minimize it. And some days you're like, today I'm making a decision. I'm going to make a decision today. I'm going to buy some cubes. (laughs) I'm going to get this storage and I'm going to be done with it. And it's okay. And you don't have to have... You don't have to have regret. You don't have to go to somebody else's house who has amazing storage cubes and be like, I should have kept looking. Just be okay. <laughs> it's just fine. But those little things can can help us manage the kind of information that we're processing. So turning down information means breaking from your points of input. Sometimes it's just silence. It's just silence. And um, that's not always my favorite thing, honestly. I love music. Something's always on in my car. Um, but sometimes just silence. I need to be with my own thoughts. What am I thinking about? How do I feel about this thing? Sometimes, have you ever had like this feeling and you're like, something's bothering me and you literally don't know what it is. You know, you feel it. You're like, what? Why am I irritated? Or why am I worried? Why am I scared? What's bothering me? I get those and I have to stop and be like, what is it? It takes me sometimes several minutes because we're so used to taking life as it goes and just filing it somewhere. But I have to stop, be present and say, Oh, I know what it is. I need to ask this person this question. I'm not sure how it's going to go. Or, oh, I had this conversation with this person. I didn't like how it really felt. Like sometimes that actually takes minutes of me not doing anything else, sitting and being present and aware of my own emotional state. And if I'm constantly taking in information, I'm always scrolling, I'm always talking, I'm always working, I'm always doing this. I don't ever have that time to stop and sit with my own thoughts. So Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, take every thought captive. I can't take no thoughts captive because I'm not still long enough to even know what thoughts need to be discarded. Um, They just get filed away and I'll deal with them when I deal with them. But they kind of create this simmering tension and anxiety that, that can really shade our whole lives. So turning up connection, turning down information. Um, are really, I think, two practical ways that we can deal with life when it's a lot. Um, moderation, you know, just the, the less that you are exposed to sometimes, the more sensitive you are to what you are exposed to, right? It's like if you know a person who's missing uh, the sense of sight or maybe the sense of hearing, if you know people like that or you've seen people like that, they tend to be much more attuned to the other four senses. Because when you take away something, it drives up sensitivity to the things that are still there. That's why we fast. That's why we kind of ext- extract ourselves from the day to day things of life. And so turning down information could be anything. It could be like no radio today, you know, no whatever. And it's not that it's bad. It's noisy. You know, it's like I'm, maybe I'm old, but it's like you driving somewhere new. I know this generation is like GPS for everything. But even if you driving somewhere new, and you got GPS. It's something about getting close to the destination. You like turn the radio down. Everybody stop talking. <laughs> I just need to focus like you can see better when it's quiet. Turn down the radio. So it's like there's something about um, removing the things that are that are inputs in our lives. And so if today or in this season or if ever you're feeling like life is a lot Um, don't feel like a failure because quoting the scripture and putting it on a sticky note didn't work. Just know that that scripture is an imperative. It's a, it's a goal, a standard that we strive for, that we are not anxious, but it's not necessarily a path. Yes. Pray um, with Thanksgiving. Paul explains that, but there may be more practical things that you need to put into place so that anxiety doesn't become defining in your life. And so whether it's turning down the information, turning up your community and connection points. Either way, um, God has a goal for you that your life be peaceful and abundant and joyful. Even when problems come, that there is a easiness and a lightness when we're connected to Jesus the way we're supposed to be. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, make sure leave a comment, leave a review, share, subscribe, all the things, and we'll catch you next time.